Welcome to City Creek, Salt Lake's neighborhood in a park. This presentation is offered as a prelude to this year's Preservation Utah Historic Homes Tour, which will be held on May 18th in the City Creek neighborhood. City Creek is perhaps Salt Lake City's most unique in that it has a combination of characteristics that is not found in any other neighborhood in the city. It's in a canyon. It's in a park. It's on a creek. It is not laid out on a grid. It was completely developed by World War II. And unlike most other neighborhoods in the city, the houses were built one by one, that is, not in multiples by developers. In referring to the canyon, I'm talking about everything up to the top of Memory Grove, that is, up to the gate just beyond Memorial House. As we look at the history of City Creek Canyon, we'll draw a contrast City Creek Canyon, we'll draw a contrast between what might have happened and how the neighborhood has actually evolved, even with flooding, industrial activity, and grand development proposals. Well, let's begin our tour of the history of City Creek Canyon with history, that is the history following settlement by Mormon pioneers. I have to acknowledge that I couldn't find information about Native American habitation or activities in the canyon, although there is an early map of the canyon in which the creek bears a Native American name. In July of 1847, advanced scouts for Mormons who were emigrating across the prairies camped along City Creek at the site of what is now Washington Square, the city and county building, and built a dam. Until the 1860s, City Creek forked just below North Temple Street, with one branch running south past what is now Washington Square, and one branch running west along what is now North Temple Street. In the early years of settlement, City Creek was the primary source of water for the city. In the 1850s, much of the canyon was deeded by the territory to ensure the purity of the water. Brigham Young used the creek to power a sawmill and a flour mill, the Empire Mill, which is circled in red in this map, which served as the namesake for Brigham Young's property, the Empire Mill Tract. Brigham Young built a wall around his wall around his property and in 1859 built the Eagle Gate on what is now State Street to mark the entrance to his property and to regulate entry into the canyon. The gate was monitored by an armed guard and anyone desiring to enter the canyon for say timber or stone had to pay a toll. The gate was had to pay a toll. The gate was closed and locked each night. State Street opened to the public in 1882. And over the years, roads in the area have been significantly modified to facilitate entry into the canyon. City Creek was, for a number of years, the primary source of water, source of water for residents of Salt Lake City. And as such, it represented an asset. But as we'll see, City Creek also represented a significant liability. City Creek was just that, a creek, an open waterway. So the water running into the city was full of sediment and other materials that would have been detrimental to the health of the residents. So in the 1870s and 1880s, the city constructed waterworks. And here's how that construction was described by the Women's Exponent in 1872. Matters are progressing in the erection of waterworks and the work of surveying for laying the piping has commenced. The water will be carried from City Creek to the principal parts of the city in sufficient volume to meet any demand for extinguishing fires and for household uses, being purified and filtered in its passage from the creek for the latter purpose and improvement. But the same creek that provided life-sustaining water also created great danger for residents. Floods on City Creek were regular, often devastating events. Here's a description of one flood in 1862. The grinding gravel grated and scraped accompaniment to the thunderous crashes of the rolling and bumping boulders. The swirling onrush of waters lashed the conglomerate mass into a foaming and dissonant chorus of nature's forces destructively rampant 
down North Tivoli Rampant, down North Temple Street. One flood in 1864 was described as being large enough to, quote, navigate a steamboat. And bridges on North Temple were regularly destroyed by floods. In an attempt to manage flooding, the, the city began in 1867 construction of an aqueduct. The Deseret News described this project as follows. The aqueduct in North Temple Street has been completed in a substantial manner, and the waters of City Creek course quietly down it in a tame and gently gurgling style. And gently gurgling style. But the reality was that the aqueduct was simply a ditch, so it didn't effectively contain floodwaters. And in fact, it was dangerous. Near drownings on the aqueduct were a regular event. Given the aqueduct's limitations, from 1896 is hardly surprising. Down the North Temple Street viaduct, the outlet from City Creek Canyon to the Jordan River, great boulders are crashing, the noise resembling almost the booming of canyon. And carried with the water also are tons upon tons of gravel, which passing the rocks further west. While the aqueduct was so insufficient that levees three to five feet high were constructed along North Temple Street to try to contain the floods. But nothing could hold the floodwaters until 1909, when the city decided to put the creek underground in a concrete culvert to protect the water supply, to prevent accidental drownings, and of course to manage flooding. But the point of this conversation about water is to illustrate that City Creek is a very different waterway than it was 120 years, 120 years ago. Imagine, for example, living along the creek as tons of boulders, gravel, and mud are raging past and perhaps through your house. Just as issues of water and water management affected the neighborhood's early history, so too, so too did industrial activity. Although water could be used for fire suppression or drinking or household chores, it also represented a different kind of resource, power. The first mill along City Creek was constructed by Charles Chrisman shortly after settlement. In 1862, Brigham Young constructed the Empire Mill that we have seen already, pictured in the upper image. The Empire Mill was located north and east of what is now Memorial House. In the lower left is an image of a mill that was located closer to North Temple Street, to North Temple Street. And in the lower right is a factory built along City Creek in 1880 for the Utah Silk Association. There were other mills in City Creek for a number of years. There was a wool carding mill constructed by Brigham Young. There was an oil mill and there was a pressure and fanning mill. There were heavier types of industry located along City Creek, closer to North Temple Street, including a blacksmith shop pictured in the image above, and a foundry and machine shop built for Brigham Young pictured in the image below. But a chill activity occurred in the early 1900s, when City Creek Canyon was an asset not because of its water, but because of its other resources. On the left is an image of a gravel pit and rock crusher, and on the right is an image of an asphalt plant, both of which operated, operated in the early 1900s in the area near what is now Memorial House. There were also mines that were developed much farther up the canyon closer to what is now called Rotary Park, and briefly there was a lime kiln operating in that area as well. Again, with a rock crusher or an asphalt plant located just up the street, so to speak. It's hard to imagine what the neighborhood might have felt like for those living in this area at the time, given all the activity that was occurring there. While City Creek offered water for drinking and water for power, and king and water for power, and the canyon offered other assets such as rock and stone, the canyon also represented another type of asset to many in the city, and there were a number of development concepts proposed for the canyon that would have dramatically affected life 
in the neighborhood. Over the years, the canyon was seen as both a natural attraction for sightseeing, for example, and as a barrier to travel between east and west through the city. By the early 1900s, concepts for a boulevard up the canyon and a bridge across the canyon were regular. The image in the lower right is from the Salt Lake Telegram in 1913, and the accompanying article describes the potential for a boulevard as follows. The beginning of a boulevard system that will make Salt Lake City the mecca of every automobilist who travels in the West, to say nothing of the thousands of, of, the thousands of devotees of the auto in Utah, has been opened to the public in the past few weeks. But the idea of some kind of bridge across City Creek Canyon was nothing new. As early as 1890, E. L. Craw had provided plans to construct a bridge or construct a bridge across the canyon at 9th North, probably now 9th Avenue, that would have been 600 feet across and 120 feet high. The images that you're looking at now were produced by Enoch Smith in 1916 in a proposal to the state legislature. And you, can, and you can see in these images not only a grand boulevard, but a grand bridge, much like the one envisioned by E. L. Craw, that would have crossed the canyon just north of the state capitol. Perhaps an even bolder proposal was drawn up by the city engineer in 1928 Center that would have been located in the area now occupied by houses in the City Creek neighborhood. The Civic Center would have included a museum, a library, a Board of Education office, the Ambassador Hotel, an art gallery, an auditorium, City Hall, Hall, the Hall of Records, and of course, a reinforced concrete bridge running from 2nd North on the west to 5th Avenue on the east. Even as late as 1933, the North Bench Improvement League had sought federal aid for a bridge across the canyon. Much earlier, in the 1880s, a very different type of road had been proposed for construction in the canyon, a railroad that would have run up the canyon over to Red Butte Canyon to transport rock from the latter down into the city. As with water, with water development and flooding and industrial development, it's not difficult to envision that a very different City Creek area might have materialized had any of these grand development ideas been realized. Well, we move now to our neighborhood in a park. By the 1870s, Brigham Young was allocating property in the canyon to family and friends. These are the earliest images of what we might call the City Creek neighborhood. On the left, we're looking southeast, and we can see one solitary home sitting inside the, inside the wall that Brigham Young had constructed around his property. That house belonged to Henry C. Jacobs. And by the way, the wall running east and west, that is down the hill, runs basically along the line of what is now 4th Avenue. On the right, we're looking southwest toward down. There are three sites of particular interest in this image. Circled in red on the left is the small mill that we looked at in the image of the three mills that we looked at earlier. Circled in black in the center is the blacksmith shop that we looked at earlier. And circled in green on the right is a home that belonged most likely to famed Mormon scout Parley P. Pratt. These images from approximately 1890 show that the area is filling in slowly with a few houses. This is a map from 1898 Company, which drafted these maps for insurance purposes. Note that there isn't even a map for the upper part of the residential area, that is the part up above 4th Avenue. By my count, by 1900 there were still fewer than 10 houses in the canyon. This image, even as late as 1905 when the image was taken, the area is still relatively sparsely developed. Note too that all the houses are down in the canyon. There are no houses on the hill. That will change. Note as well 
In the center of the image, the beginnings of a park. These maps were produced in 1911 by the Sanborn Company. We now have a map for the upper lower part of the canyon, the upper part of the residential area, on the right. My estimate is that by 1911, when this map was produced, there were about 20 houses in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. Note as well the area circled in red. That is the East Canyon Road, which at the time was called Cooper Lane. I don't know the origin of the name, but it's interesting that it stayed with this particular branch of the Canyon Road until the 1950s at least. These at least. This image from 1930 shows that dwellings are now being constructed on the hillside up into the canyon. Note as well that the park in the center of the image is more completely developed by this time. These Sanborn maps from 19 that at this point in the mid-1920s, the residential area of City Creek, the neighborhood, is basically filled in. Since the earliest days of settlement, there had been interest in developing parks around the community, including in City Creek Canyon. And as the residential area was developing, there was interest in developing a park in the canyon. As you can see in these images, the canyon certainly did have park-like attributes. It felt almost, in a sense, isolated from the city. But even with all the interest, and even with the park-like, even with all the interest, and even with the park-like attributes of the canyon, for various reasons, the discussion about developing a park there remained just that, a discussion. The image on the right is from 1911, so we're nearly 25 years from the article in the previous slide, yet, yet still no park in the canyon. Finally, by 1912, a park was developed at, quote, the mouth of the canyon. These images are from that period, just as the park was completed. This image from slightly later shows the park as it had been developed and completed in the center of the neighborhood. This park is a defining element of the neighborhood, and in many ways, the neighborhood, the houses, are a defining element of the park as well. Finally, in 1921, the park was actually dedicated and called City Creek Creek Park. It would be an oversight, of course, not to mention Memory Grove. Memory Grove is adjacent to the City Creek neighborhood, and to that extent, it informs the neighborhood. But unlike the park, City Creek Park, that is in the neighborhood, Memory Grove is not of the neighborhood. Even though it's, even though it's adjacent to the neighborhood, it does not, like City Creek Park, define the City Creek neighborhood. As we look at these contemporary images of the City Creek neighborhood, it's important to note that the canyon is the defining element of the neighborhood. The houses are crowded on the hillside, like any other neighborhood in the city. This area is reminiscent of other hillside cities, such as San Francisco, perhaps, or Seattle. But the neighborhood is also defined by the park, as mentioned earlier, and the park is defined by the neighborhood. The two are integral to each other. It's important to note that the City Creek neighborhood is a historic district. This year's Historic Homes Tour will take place on May 18th in the City Creek Historic District. The tour is a great opportunity to explore Salt Lake City's most unique neighborhood, to see a neighborhood that is informed as much by topography as it is by streets, to see a neighborhood that has a relationship with a park that no other neighborhood has. It's an opportunity to explore houses that represent the lives of everyday people in 1910 or 1920 or 1930, to envision yourself living in those houses during that, houses during that period because this neighborhood is very much like it was in the early 1900s. For more information on the tour, you can visit Preservation Utah's website